Welcome to the Exposium podcast, Wines of the Future. Where are we coming from? Where are we now? And where are we heading? My name is Gabrielle Zavona, and with top international experts, we'll be discussing the past, present, and future of the wine industry fast forward in 50 years. We are very happy to welcome Master of Wine Jasper Morris for our Vinexpo Wines of the Future talk with a special focus on Burgundy. Hello, Jasper. Hello, Gabrielle. How are you? Good. And you? Yes, I'm well. Jasper, you're Master of Wine since 1985, just a few years after you created a successful wine import business called Morris and Verdun. The company was later acquired by Barry and Bross and Rudd in 2003, and you were appointed its buying director. In May 2008, together with colleagues at BBR, you published the Future of Wine report, speculating on the state of the wine industry in the coming 50 years. After you retired from trade, you embarked on a new career as a Burgundy expert. You are indeed awarded author of Inside Burgundy with Inside Burgundy 2 that has just been published. You've been as well appointed as senior consultant for Hospice de Bonne Wine Auction, and you've launched in 2018 a website named Jasper Morris Inside Burgundy, which is the reference for all Burgundy lovers. You're pretty busy, Jasper, aren't you? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean, theoretically, uh, should have retired, but I uh, seem to be busier than ever, but still. Very active retirement. What are you currently working on? Well, it's the website takes an enormous amount of my time because I go and taste as much as possible uh, in the producer's cellars and then write up the tasting notes so that it helps people make the judgments as to what wines they might want to buy. How many burgundies do you try every year? Oh, I, I publish notes. This is going to sound ridiculous because uh, there are only 365 uh, days in the year, but I will publish five or 6,000 tasting notes in a given year. Wow. Okay, so Jasper, what are the most unexpected changes you acknowledged in the wine business since you started your career? Well, one would be something which affects everybody in all businesses and indeed in their own lives uh, is the change in communications. That instead of it being a question of uh, doing everything by phone or a handwritten letter or a typed letter, uh, nowadays most things go through the computer and you can communicate in any way you want and you can get information of any sort you want. So instead of somebody just having their regular wine merchant who would send them a paper catalogue every so often and a really interested customer might have two or three merchants like that, nowadays everybody is playing around to see who in which part of the world has what price for, for any given wine. So that's one thing. I suppose something I didn't necessarily expect at the start was that I'd be able to have a, a happy career and earn money in, in wine for well over 40 years now. And I suppose the range of wines available around the world has changed because when I started, it was really France plus classical parts of Germany, Italy, Spain and Portugal. Definitely. So more diversity and a better access to information. Yes. In 2008, you published a Future of Wine report speculating on the state of the wine industry in the coming 50 years. Almost 15 years later, what has come true so far and which correction would you make uh, to this previous analysis, if any? I'm not sure if I have any specific corrections. Uh, I can remember a few things that I particularly worked on for that report. One was that we said China was going to be very important. Obviously, a country the size of China can totally destabilize a market, either by everybody becoming a, a fine wine drinker or by producing lots of fine wine. And I set out the idea that in China, they would find areas which would be capable of producing really world-class wine. There's one actually up in the mountains in Yunnan, very close to Tibet, uh, a winery called Ao Yun, which has started to make great wine, which is sold expensively. And there will be more. So that was one thing. Another thing that we worked on was the idea that wine would divide much more sharply into genuinely fine wine, uh, which needs to come from a particular place and specific grape varieties that suit that place, and regular everyday commercial wine, which needs to be inexpensive and which needs to have a flavor profile that suits the market at the time. So basically, you would produce a fairly uh, neutral juice and then get your marketing department to say how the additional flavoring um, should be added. And I personally had the idea that people would maybe 
not grow the grapes on land anymore because land prices would be too high, but they would grow them on barges offshore, uh, grow them hydroponically, and then just harvest them and, uh, and vinify the grapes back on land. My third idea, which I was particularly amused by, was that bees would take a part because bees, as you probably know, have incredibly sensitive antennae, and they can actually pick up one trillionth of a particular molecule and identify it as long as they're trained to look for that molecule. So I had this idea that you would have sommelier bees who would live in a little box in the sommelier's pocket, and they would be given a sniff of the wine as it was opened, and if that antennae uh, twitched, then you would know that that wine was corked. And it would save a lot of uh, awkward backwards and forwards and pouring the wine out and, uh, and the sommelier saying, non, monsieur, uh, that wine is not corked. So that was an idea of mine, but uh, that hasn't taken off as yet. This would be great. It may be a little bit dangerous for the sommelier, but... <laughs> well, I, I, um, I hope not. I hope it would be a happy bee and a happy sommelier and more importantly, a happy customer. <laughs> You have written a bestseller about Burgundy as having launched your website, Jasper Morris Inside Burgundy, in 2018. In the past 10 years, prices of Burgundy skyrocketed. Yeah. Do you think it will continue that way or can we expect a market correction at some point? I've been expecting a market correction since 2005 and so far it hasn't happened. <laughs> so if we go back to before the millennium, Burgundy was theoretically a producer of great wine but the markets didn't really believe in it. The wines had been too inconsistent and nobody was really championing it, or at least, I mean, a few people such as me were, but it wasn't uh, generally accepted. The world still wanted uh, more Bordeaux and then plenty of other wines, uh, which were less expensive, and Burgundy was hit and miss. From around 2005, which was a great vintage, and at that moment when uh, communications became a lot better, suddenly everyone in the world began to hear about Burgundy. And the thing that I've been working for unsuccessfully for 20 years began to happen uh, too quickly. Is that the expression, be careful what you wish for? Uh, and, uh, and suddenly, from um, trying my hardest to get people to buy some, it was a question of almost trying to persuade people not to buy too much. So, <laughs> I mean, it is very limited in produce. And also, you have to take into account that a top Bordeaux Chateau might have, for example, 100 hectares from which they make one or two wines. And a top Burgundy producer might have only 10 or 20 hectares from which they make 15 different wines. So of any given wine... So you're confessing, Jasper, that it's, it's a little bit your fault if we Europeans are, are too poor now to buy Burgundy. Well, I mean, that's, that's being a little <laughs> bit... Uh, uh, that's being, uh, I, I would be claiming a little bit too much if, uh, if uh, I ascribed it just to me. But uh, um, certainly the success of Burgundy uh, is largely pricing it out of many people's uh, pockets. But it's also true to say that because the wines are being made so much better than they used to be made, It is now the case that you can get um, exciting Burgundies from less well-known appellations, villages, um, which are doing a beautiful job, which would not have been true in an earlier period. So what would be uh, the long-term consequence of that drastic raise of price? I don't know. I just have remained enormously surprised that it's continued to happen, that there hasn't been uh, a revolution against it. But uh, at the moment, we've been living through a period in which those people with a lot of money have been uh, looking for where they can place their money. And uh, interest rates have been very low. Various other things have made certain classical forms of investment less attractive. Uh, and so wine has become a place. I'm always very sad if uh, wine is being used specifically as an investment vehicle particularly wines from Burgundy, where the producers themselves just don't want that. The, the reason, this is true of most of them, perhaps not all, but the reason they've made the wine is so that you can have a glorious wine to enjoy and to drink. Uh, they haven't made it in order that you can profit from it and make money. With uh, global warming that you were mentioning already in your Future of Wine report in 2008, there is uh, an increased number of natural catastrophes. Is Burgundy jeopardized uh, as a Pinot Noir producing region? 
Uh, I'm afraid so. It's not absolutely certain. Whites are going to be easier to manage because Chardonnay, we know you can make great Chardonnay anywhere in the world, including a number of rather hotter climates. We also have this um, second grape, Aligote, which is becoming a lot more interesting in these warmer times. And that will start to play a bigger role. But it's impossible to see any other grape other than Pinot Noir in the top vineyards of Burgundy, in the Grand Cru's and so on. Now, it does depend on exactly how much warmer it's going to get, and we still don't know. Uh, A lot of intelligent things are being done in terms of viticulture. Quite a few vineyards have had to be replanted as the vines are already failing in the hotter climates. But then you can change the rootstock, you can probably change the clone, or at least um, plant material that you use for the main part of the Pinot. You can go to later ripening versions and you can change how you do your viticulture. But everybody is slightly having to guess in which direction to change it. So um, some of the attempts to change it probably won't work out and others will. So I think we can manage, we can get back to a more normal state of affairs with the current level of global warming. We can probably cope if it goes up a little bit more. But if it goes up a lot more, then it's going to be a problem. And indeed, we may get to the position, and if it goes up too much, that none of us is going to care where our next bottle of fine wine comes from. We'll just all be trying to stay alive. Can we expect another grape variety to take over the the area someday? I don't think so. Uh, I mean, yes, to make perfectly decent wines, but to make truly great wines, then I think um, it probably needs to be Pinot with the soil that we got, the terroir we've got. We're already finding that some vineyards, which used to be regarded as great vineyards, are just a little bit less exciting uh, now than they were. And others, which we thought of as a little bit second rate, are becoming much more interesting. The Pinot can move north to northern Burgundy, uh, maybe some still wines in Champagne, possibly can cross the channel if it can get the right paperwork. Uh, <laughs> to allow that to happen, as we've seen that the sparkling wines have become fantastically successful um, in the UK, and genuinely so. That's not just marketing, they're, they're a wonderful product, and that's happened really quite quickly. So we may find that Pinot moves a little bit to find its best habitat, but I can't really foresee uh, grapes like Syrah or Grenache uh, being true stars on the limestone of Burgundy. In 2016, you were appointed senior consultant for the annual Hospice de Bonne Wine auction. How can we expect the wine auction landscape to evolve in the future? This is a very different auction from any other in the world because it is about selling the brand new wine in barrels. And when we talk wine auction, we're sort of rather expecting people in pinstripe suits in the the financial centers uh, of the world, you know, London, Paris, New York, Hong Kong, Geneva, and just a certain small volume of fine wine to be uh, sold backwards and forwards between richer wine drinkers. But the Osprey's to Bone wine auction is very different. Um, it's charitable. So there's no reason why that shouldn't continue as long as Good Burgundy continues, because uh, that's an auction which has, was started uh, in the middle of the 19th century and uh, continues except in years of the worst of war or COVID or the like. Whether the more classical auctions will evolve, already we're seeing some which take place more online rather than in the sale room. And I think they have become more and more pushed in the direction of the very, very finest wines. Because if you get two uh, sort of alpha male type collectors who each want to have the only one uh, magnum of something really special that's up for sale, Uh, then that's where you get the uh, even more stupidly high prices. More generally, what is the craziest change that you can imagine, Jasper, the viticulture will have to face in 50 years' time? um, The bees will take over the vineyards. Well, exactly, yeah. (laughs) Or or the vines will start eating humans rather than the other way around. Uh, Yes, I remember when I was doing my Master of Wine exams, One of the, it was during the sort of practice period when we were being coached in it. And one of the coaches said, okay, everybody, please come up with an article about wine written in the style of your favorite newspaper. 
So people wrote with the Times or Telegraph or could have been Figaro in France. But um, uh, somebody somebody uh, did it in the, in the format of uh, one of our uh, weirder English newspapers, News of the World, and his headline was, Aliens Ate My Vineyard. But um, <laughs> just in the news at the moment, there are talks of getting together moon probes and Mars probes, and uh, maybe on the second or third human probe into Mars, somebody will take some vines up with them and uh, start to produce some wine up there. Who knows? <laughs> What do you expect the taste uh, of wine to be like in 50 years' time? Can you describe the wine of the future? I think as long as we can still make them, I think more will stay the same that will change. I mean, we have an indication of what um, wine was like in, in Roman times and Greek times, but particularly Roman times, we already had um, uh, wine snobs around and there's uh, some amusing stories of, of a wine snob who was uh, boasting that he got a particular vintage of Falernian a Pimian Falernian, which would have come from 121 BC. This was 100 years later, but it was a, sort of a brand new, young, fresh wine. But uh, somebody had uh, sold it to him, <laughs> telling him it was a great old wine. So wine fraud existed then, exists now. People were wine snobs then, they are now, and they will be in the future. Um, but the core will be that you can open a bottle of wine And just that first sniff, the aromas that come out will just set your, 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 your I'm, I can feel my face breaking into a smile. And uh, if you're a cat, you'd start purring and you just get that thrill of something which is magical, which transcends what the pure grape itself could do. Thank you so much for your time. Absolutely. Thank you, Gabrielle. <laughs> and uh, bye bye. Thank you for tuning into Wines of the Future. Don't miss the next episode and subscribe to this podcast. You can also leave us a comment and follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn at Vinexposium.